Hello, everybody. This is the Flotilla Friday call for uh, May 21st, 2021. Uh, welcome. Uh, so I was I was uh, telling uh, somebody right before this that uh, these calls are always kind of freeform. So I don't know if that's a good way to start or not. Um, uh, Mark Carenza did a, a really interesting demo of his uh, tiny demo of his MX system yesterday on the on the OGM call. That was really cool. Um, uh, I've got now that now that I think about it, I've got a list of stuff that's on top of mind for me, and I'm just going to steal it from yesterday's uh, OGM calls list. Uh, hang on, while I find it. Um, so there's a, a bunch of interesting stuff going on in, uh, um, I, so I'm trying to figure out the name of the, the thing that we were, uh, swimming in the, the primordial soup. Um, the Plex is a name I really like a lot. Um, and I, I've got some like really cool ideas for the Plex, uh, um, but I don't think I'm ready to talk about them yet, but, um, but anyway, there's a bunch of stuff going on. Massive is going really well um, uh, in lots of different kind of small ways. Um, uh, uh, we'll hear about uh, Vincent's stuff. Um, Michael, it sounds like you're doing all kinds of amazing things that we haven't hooked into very well yet. Um, the generative commons is going on. Uh, it's it's uh, starting bootstrap. Um, there's a, a small cloistered work group talking about um, generating income from uh, curating and curated uh, knowledge assets. Um, and that's really cool. Um, uh, that's also not quite ready to talk yet, uh, but uh, it's pretty cool. Um, there's a, we're also, there's a few of us sovereigns in uh, OGM language. Uh, we're thinking about uh, making a coalition of sovereigns. Um, there's like three or four, four of us. So that's another kind of thing that's starting to bubble up and, and we might might work on. Um, Could you guys digress to expand on the notion of sovereigns? Um, yeah, sure thing. Um, and, a, and a flag for me, um, or, or a flag, as I've been thinking about it today. I guess, you know, the one of the things that, um, hang on while I grab an iPad and I'm just gonna show you the iPad instead of, um, uh, instead of hooking it up to Zoom like I could do, but I won't do that right now. Um, and, uh, uh, this is a blast from the past. This is from, December 26th, uh, and you can see um, Catalyst there with its old name. Um, I think that's really cool. Uh, so then uh, yesterday I, I drew a messier one. Um, uh, this was from a chat that I was having with Lorelei. Uh, so each of these circles is a sovereign um, for what it's worth. Uh, so it was interesting, uh, Lorelai um, is an individual still and she's she's wondering, you know, I, I'm telling her, dude, you got to join the, the suit, man. It's, it's awesome. And she's like, yeah, it's kind of cool. I've got other stuff going on in my life. Tell me why I would join the, the you know, this flotilla of stuff. Um, a flotilla is another, another word that has two meanings uh, with a big F. It's uh, the flotilla uh, tools for connectors group that we're in right now. And then with a little F, it just means a generic, uh, generic group of uh, sovereigns floating together, hopefully hopefully in a good direction. Um, uh, uh, anyway, sovereign is, uh, so, so as I've been thinking about these sovereigns and making maps and things like that, um, and trying to explain it to people, uh, making maps so that I can explain it to people. Um, uh, I, one of the things I notice is that um, I, uh, names are interesting um, and terminology is interesting. And then terminology ends up having a bunch of meetings in one space. So OGM has a bunch of terminology that it uses. And then when you go to another space, sometimes you have to translate it. 
Um, another interesting thing for me is, is names. Uh, and um, for a long time, I, you know, I, I'm a child of, of the, you know, dot com boom and the internet and DNS and things like that. And so I'm, and trademarks, I know a lot about IP and stuff like that. Uh, so I, I always get hesitant around reusing somebody's, you know, somebody's brand name. And uh, uh, the one of the pickles I find myself in right now is the Massive Human Intelligence Project, which is an umbrella for Massive Wiki. Um, wants to have a, a little thing called, or a big thing called the Knowledge Weavers Guild, Guild of, Guild of Knowledge Weavers or something like that. Knowledge weaving is a big thing for massive human intelligence. So um, Knowledge Weavers is kind of already used by other people, you know, so I was like, well, that, that can't be the brand name. Um, that's too bad. Um, but now, this morning I was thinking, you know, people have dupli duplicate names, um, you know, and and you kind of disambiguate based on context and, you know, surnames sometimes and things like that. And, you know, it's like maybe uh, I'm inspired a little bit by the generative commons. Um, maybe, you know, maybe there's things with, with the same name and maybe that's okay. And maybe you just disambiguate the way people disambiguate, you know, human names and maybe that's okay. Um, so anyway, sovereigns uh, is something that is in the conversation between OGM and Lionsburg, and that's kind of what we settled on. Um, uh, another, you know, we've used other names for these groups of people, uh, small groups usually uh, of people doing stuff together. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, and in this discussion with Lorelai, the map that I drew is kind of like weird because it felt weird drawing her as a sovereign, as an individual, but in the conversations with OGM and, and Lionsburg, We've always thought, you know, there's sovereign groups and sovereign individuals. Everybody's sovereign, and most people are sovereign individuals. And the, the sovereignty is the important part. And we, we kind of shorthanded sovereign group into sovereigns, and that's what we, you know, that's kind of what we've nicknamed the kind of clusterings that um, are OGM and Kika Lab and massive, uh, massive human intelligence project, probably and Trove and things like that. Um, so then I was thinking about the difference between an individual and a sovereign, and maybe it's that uh, a sovereign has a group of people, and I don't know if that's it. Maybe a sovereign has an asset. Um, so Trove has Catalyst, um, and Massive massive Human Intelligence Project has Massive Wiki as kind of an asset, a project, you know. Um, maybe that's the difference between a, a sovereign and an individual, and, and I don't know, still thinking through it. So thanks for the question, Mark, and sorry for the long-winded answer, and and thank you for listening to a bunch of stuff that is is bubbling for me. I learn things by listening, and I'm happy to listen. Um, there was something that uh, you said, OGM and Lionsburg. Lionsburg. What yeah. is um, like? Is that all one word? Uh, yeah, and it's spelled with an e. Um, uh, and, and basically, you know, what I do is I type things in and they're seeds. So once I have typed down Lionsburg, all it, it automatically starts a list and there's going to be entries on Lionsburg that, uh, um, you know, I don't, you don't have to, um, you can skip it for me at least. Um, but if other people don't know what Lionsburg no, is. No, it's, yeah. it's, it's useful to kind of go through it. And, and probably we all have a little bit of awareness of, of Lionsburg. Um, uh, Lionsburg is another sovereign uh, in OGM terminology. So I, I forget some of the names I've used for sovereigns with other folks. Um, but, but we've said collective. I, I say collective, collective of collectives of collectives. Uh, coalescence is another thing that I've used. Um, work group. Uh, you know, organization, when it goes into, into Catalyst, uh, it, it's an organization. Um, and, and while I'm on the terminology, OGM has some other terminology, Guild and um, Quest, that it has kind of, res I think it's actually o OGM Bootstrap, interestingly enough, I think it's kind of reserved the idea of wanting to define more what Quest means and what Guild means. And of course, Quest and Guild come from other places, um, one of the places I know it from actually is uh, Henrik Nyberg, uh, an agile guy, a guy who does agile stuff for Spotify or did Spotify for a long time. Um, he has this brilliant diagram of of the way that they organize their um, their 
teams of uh, de uh, product uh, development folks uh, into squads and guilds and tribes and and whatever else. Anyway, um, Lionsburg is another sovereign. Um, uh, its job in life, uh, the the guy, the the leader behind it is a guy named Jordan uh, Sukut, uh, S U K U T. Um, and Lionsburg is forming. Uh, Jordan has a has a family business uh, history of uh, big scale construction projects, um, dams and overpasses, and like big, you know, uh, big stuff, building big stuff. So he's got a uh, uh, a bit of a background in organizational stuff. He's got a bit of a background in finance. He's got a bit of a background in you know, working with legal systems and things like that. So Lionsburg um, and uh, Jordan and Lionsburg, I apologize if I if I mischaracterize you, but um, Lionsburg is kind of in the business of, of figuring out structures um, that could be useful for sovereigns, um, actually a flotilla of sovereigns. Um, so there's a, a flotilla of sovereigns connected to Lionsburg that I don't know very well. Um, one of them is the Open Future Coalition. Um, and, and then I think there's more, but I don't know them. Um, and then uh, Lionsburg has been working with OGM, OGM Bootstrap. Um, at some point, maybe we'll differentiate between OGM and OGM Bootstrap. Um, uh, Lionsburg has been working with OGM Bootstrap and the OGM Stewards. Um, another thing that's a little bit different than either OGM Bootstrap or OGM, uh, because OGM uh, wants to be in the business of, of being a crucible, a nursery, a star nursery kind of for uh, these sovereigns. Uh, so OGM has a lot of thinking and vision about, um, about what it would take for a bunch of sovereigns in a flotilla to work together. Um, and also it has a bunch of ideas about how how maybe the, the transition process from you know you're you're an individual a sovereign individual and you've got some crazy and cool ideas for the world but you don't know what to do right you don't know how to do maybe you don't know how to do project management or maybe you don't know maybe you aren't handy with tech infrastructure or maybe you don't know how to um, market yourself you don't know how to do outreach um uh but maybe you've got the 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 best idea in the world that's going to save the, the planet and so OGM wants to help you find yourself find you know either your inner voice and your um, and connect you with the the needs that you have to other people um, who have you know things that they can offer you help with project management or help with naming or helping with whatever um, or maybe maybe the thing that's that's best for you to do OGM wants to help you find um, fellows, uh, people that are, you know, could be in a sovereign around you. Um, or maybe you just want to be a fellow in somebody's sovereign and you don't really care what the sovereign is doing, but as long as it's of good intent and aligned with kind of your, your desired direction, um, um, you know, maybe that's, maybe, maybe you're just going to join a sovereign and, and not be the, the leader of it, but, um, uh, um, I don't want to say follower because that's the wrong, the wrong uh, a member maybe. Um, so anyway, OGM wants to help these sovereigns form and get better and and you know find the structures they need, the communication infrastructure, collaboration infrastructure, all that kind of stuff. So Lionsburg needs that service. So it has been looking to OGM to provide that service and in service of that goal. Um, it has been working hard with OGM and the OGM stewards, especially, to um, to figure out how to fund. Um, it, it ended up funding OGM Bootstrap. Um, how to fund that um, so that it could be doing good work of helping other uh, the sovereigns form and coalesce. And so then Lionsburg could help fund those. So Lionsburg, the, the special sauce that Jordan has uh, is connectivity with very big structured things like the legal system. Um, so if you want to take money um, and you want to be tax exempt, um, so say you're OGM Bootstrap or Massive or Trove or Kikolab, 
you want to take money and you want to be tax exempt um, so that people will give you more money because they're looking for places to put their tax exempt donations. Um, there's a bunch of like infrastructure you need um, and it's a pain in the butt to do and you can f run afoul of laws really quickly. One of the interesting things that Jordan observed is that if you're raising money um, and uh, you're, you're uh, if you're accepting charitable donations and uh, you're doing that on the internet, all of a sudden you've got a presence in all the US states um, and each state has different laws about charitable donations and how to how to manage them and stuff like that. So it's pretty quickly, you can run a foul of laws that you don't even know about because you're just on the internet. You're not in all the states physically. So Lionsburg has spent a lot of effort and a couple of years at setting up a, a structure where they've got um, a 501c3 and a C corp um, so that um, so that some of the stuff that can be done is it it would look to it would look for profit to the IRS. Um, uh, they have the ability to accept. So if a sovereign has the ability to, a uh, sovereign can make a deal. Hey, hey, Lionsburg, let's make a deal. And if Lionsburg says yes, um, the sovereign does fundraising, points them to the Lionsburg donation site. It goes into a 501c3 earmarked for the sovereign that was doing the fundraising. Um, and then, and then technically there's still a little bit of handshake that needs to go on um, every time the, the sovereign wants to allocate a chunk of that earmarked fund, uh, it needs to make a, a formal request, you know, uh, hi, I need a grant to um, fix XYZ bugs uh, in Massive Wiki Builder or something like that. Or, you know, I, uh, Massive Wiki wants to hire a developer for, you know, 20 hours and it's going to be working on these kinds of things. Um, uh, Jordan really wants to make that as simple as possible, but for the IRS, you know, his relationship, Lionsburg's relationship with the 501c3 um, and the IRS, um, they need to kind of document, you know, where the money goes, because obviously the IRS doesn't want to give tax exemptions to Pete taking massive funds and, you know, going to Aruba and having a grand old time and not actually being productive for the, the rest of uh, society. So long, so story long short, as you're productive in Aruba. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, well, you know, uh, it gets into the, the IRS, uh, the, the auditors, you know, and um, how much they think that the, the, you know, maybe, maybe the hotel in Aruba is, is uh, tax exempt, but maybe not the airfare to get Pete to Aruba, because probably Pete probably could have done the same work in San Diego. I don't know. Um, above my pay grade or outside of my, my purview. Um, the other interesting thing that happened with the discussion between the OGM stewards group and uh, Jordan was uh, a, a coalescence of activation energy around the generative commons idea. So um, that's a, a new proto sovereign. It's not a sovereign yet. Um, OGM bootstrap is, is shepherding it um, on its way to becoming whatever it becomes. Um, uh, so there's a channel on Mattermost for for generative commons, and I, we're all excited about it. Meeting next week on Wednesday. One one question I've had just about the the um, the structure um, with Lionsburg is Lionsburg has a for profit and a five hundred one c three, and um, the the for profit entity is not their whole construction business, right? It's just its no. own thing. Yeah. Um, and um, and the, the sub sovereigns or the, the sovereigns who are in, involved in the- uh, you know, Fiscal sponsees. Fiscal sponsees um, are by necessity all nonprofits or- I, To, to or, my understanding- or maybe seem like they're not formed really. Yeah, to my understanding, um, we're still working through that. Um, so Jordan's intent. Uh, so OGM, for instance, has the concept that um, there's nonprofit. The the whole you know the whole profit thing is weird. I mean, because you know, to something like OGM or <laughs> Massive Wiki, it doesn't really, it doesn't parse almost. Um, but anyway. 
OGM is going to be doing public good things, but then it's also going to have consulting groups um, that are making money for themselves, right? Um, same thing with Massive Wiki. You know, um, Massive Wiki is an open source software project that's dedicated to the commons. Um, uh, uh, the Knowledge Weavers Guild, um, hopefully, uh, everybody in, in it is making money from knowledge weaving. Um, uh, Jordan needs to, to sort that out more. Um, basically, uh, I think, and his intent is that both of those activities are, are okay. Um, Lionsburg in particular, so you can also imagine um, uh, other sovereigns that are like Lionsburg with different rules of play, different, you know, uh, different uh, tax structures and things like that. Um, but anyway, Lionsburg in particular, I think uh, his his fiscal or Lionsburg's fiscal sponsorships, not really Jordan's. Lionsburg's Lionsburg, as it fiscally sponsors sovereigns, uh, wants them to be 100% generative commons um, stuff, rather than. So I think uh, generative commons already has the concept of. I'd have to go look real quick, but it, it has the concept that there is value flow, and and you know that's not a bad thing. Um, so I guess a, a little bit of the generative commons is is working through that, right? Um, uh, in the enclosure society, in the in the capitalist society, we've got these weird differentiations between you know nonprofits. How it can't be, you know, creating value for themselves or something. I don't know. It doesn't make sense. So the some of that needs to get rejiggered and Creative Commons already the um, founding document has some of that kind of, you know, you can start to see some of the discussion coming out of that. There is a fine art and then there's a low art of finance. And um, certainly, uh, you know, the Internet Archive has money making um, aspects you know selling uh indexing and hosting of backups of entities like um the australian government to harvard's um web presences and certainly above my pay grade in terms of how all that stuff is is worked out and certainly not my interest um god thank god other people do that stuff <laughs> Um, Brewster has always been a like a, he's a financial with a ninja kind of um, the whole setting up um, setting up Alexa so that it was uh, uh, I, I guess I guess it's the other way around setting up Alexa as a as a as a for profit commercial you know like real company but it also has the the trailing benefit to Internet Archive um, that was brilliant um, and. I, I love to use that as an example of hacking the system for good. Um, so I, you know, every once in a while, I hear, I'll hear Brewster talking about something. The last one I remember was um, he was hacking. Um, uh, he, he thought it was weird that uh, we've got this structure where you have these 30 year loans for places to live. And so I remember he was thinking about buying an apartment building and, you know, equaling out the cutting out basically the financial middlemen the the people paying you know uh uh collecting rent basically or, or sorry not collecting rent uh, uh rent a year is uh collecting um finance you know finance uh interest basically um, taking the value of interest removing that from the cost of rent yes for, exactly uh, yeah. for the tenants and uh and it turns out to be a lot cheaper yeah Yes. <laughs> Oddly enough. Yeah, finance is expensive. Um I I need to refinance my credit cards. Um leeches are expensive. Yes. They are. Thank you for all that. Um boy, did I hear a lot of utterances which I typed in which uh are unique to the system, which are unique to, you know, my head. Um and uh you know, certainly you know, creating this map by one thing to another, which leads to another to another. But uh, are there maps of these things that other people have access to? Certainly, you know, you mentioned um, uh, a number of different sovereigns, but within OGM, a number of different groups that are actively pursuing 
systems, goals, interactions, um, uh, developing um, shared habits and shared terminology. Um, you know, you offered for people coming into Mattermost, I think, like a map or or one of the other um, of many different systems, you know, how to navigate OGM forum or something. Um, but, uh, um, and I haven't been to those sites for a month or two now, but, um, and I, I see I, a heck of a lot more activity. Um, yeah, as far as I know, we don't have, we don't have good maps. Um, and, and I've actually been, you know, thinking through that for the past week and a half or something like that. Um, and the, the iPad drawings are, you know, I finally forced myself because because it's so simple and, and basic and I hate it, you know, that, you know, it's like 2D and it's circles. And and so today I, um, I when I, if if uh, if and when I get around to it, I've, I've got a couple posts brewing to the maps and map mapping map maps and map. I guess it's actually maps and mapping, maybe um, there's a uh, yeah maps and mapping. There's a maps and mapping channel on um, on Mattermost uh, and there's a uh, 23 people right now are, who are interested in maps. So for, for those folks, mapping is mostly um, uh, the act of, of uh, researching the, the landscape and, and then, you know, codifying the, what they find some, somehow, usually in maybe a knowledge graph or, or you know, graph database or, or something like that. Um, I've been the so the one of the things I've been wishing for for this this week or something like that is kind of a 3D you know Star Trekky kind of thing where um, I can have all these blobs and they look like fuzzy clouds instead of like spheres um, and they don't have these you know it's not sticks and balls uh, because those are really dorky looking but it's this fuzzy sphere that looks like it would be in Star Trek or or a Tom Cruise movie or something like that and and you can kind of grab them and move them around and you know and uh, Lionsburg looks really small because I'm talking about OGM or massive, but then you go, but Lionsburg is super big and then you grab it and pull it over and expand it and things like that, right? That's what I want. We're not there yet. So um, the, the, <laughs> the hack that I'm thinking of today is um, uh, instead of circles, maybe those should be stick figures like people um, or faces maybe, or little animals. I think animals is the one I like best. Um, so I've got some sketchy animals I, I was searching for, and those those look good. Um, so maybe um, I'm also thinking about trading cards, actually, or uh, or card cards, you know, trading card size cards, uh, a picture of a person or an animal representing um, a trove and representing massive and things like that. Massive is an elephant so far. Um, uh, uh, Peter. Yeah. If I, if I can, there are already what is it? Um, uh... UTF um, emojis, which are yeah. they're, yeah. They're, like they're, they're many and various, and uh, I'm not sure you know how many people have colored them in, in various. Uh, that's um, a that's a good idea. Um, I think you would want a, a couple of them. Yeah, one of the Twitter accounts I follow actually does a mashup of of two emojis. Um, uh, it's a, a bot that does that, and, and I don't know how much it person is involved but um the, the a lot of the emojis are svg so you can actually take the eyes from one and the the mouth and the face from the another one and and do cool things with it um but i think so i i like that idea a lot and it seems like you'd have to have a couple emojis for massive or a couple emojis for you know uh, trove or whatever i wonder if you can do a geometric connections of emojis in a 3d space kind of thing you know make some smaller some some bigger that would um, be super awesome huh. yeah. um, um quick question um yep. i am learning how to uh certainly stand up every hour um but i'm wondering in these zoom calls about you know taking you know little Breaks, exercise or, you know, breaks. Yeah, yeah. Tur turning the uh, turning the video off and you know standing up and silly things. Um, uh, and I, I haven't seen that happen. Um, I just uh, and I'm not you demanding. It. You'll, you'll see you'll see video blink off and just uh, the icon there for a bit. I'm about to do that. 
but um <laughs> yeah i kind of do it without asking permission just like you know no video for the first half hour of this meeting because i'm outside <laughs> yeah. sure. um it's it's just uh something that um you know we do in team meetings at work um you know depending on how long the meeting is going to last and um that's a great question how long does this meeting last uh it, it's free form <laughs> Okay. Fair enough. Uh, so it's as long as we can stand. I I uh, I get kind of bored and restless after about two and a half hours. So not not bored actually usually, but um, but I, I have after about I have team meetings starting at ten. So uh, uh, and yeah. one you know one hour is actually a good time. I yeah. I uh, I actually like um, uh, I like meetings that that are quick um, and get get a lot of stuff done. I don't know if that we're getting a lot of stuff done. But. Well, um, you're educating me. Um, certainly, that uh, that's all I can understand at the moment. I don't know Michael or Vincent's. Uh, you know, they have different connections uh, with OGM and different uh, you know temporal windows that um, they've been yeah. connected. Um, it's good to see you know the four of the three of you, um, the four of us. Um, uh, I appreciate you answering the questions and, uh, boy, you've given, you're a great communicator, um, Peter. Um, and, uh, you have an, an additional kind of use of superlatives like super and fantastic and tremendous. <laughs> that, uh, is charming. Well, thank, thank you. Uh, that's great feedback. I appreciate it. Um, before we get too far away from MX and, and actually this will be a, a discussion for some other time. I think we don't have to cover it all today, but um, I, I wanted to mention semantic triples. So it looks like your things are a little bit like triples. Uh, okay. Um, um, very you know. quickly, not at all. So basically, you know, primary to a semantic triple is a, trim, is a semantic duple. Um, yeah. So <laughs> if we take Peter and Vincent as notions, as clouds, fuzzy clouds, um, yep. the relations between Peter and Vincent um, are uncountable. It's really, you know, you can, you know, say Peter is a friend of Vincent's. Peter is a employer of, of Vincent. Peter is a mentor of Vincent. Peter is a mentee of Vincent from time to time. It just, it's really, um, uh, it seems like the duple is primary and I haven't evolved the system for evolving the triples of which there are, are multiple. Um, somebody referred me to a critique of Leibniz by Bertrand Russell, who basically says, you know, any feature of say a lemon um, is finite for that particular lemon, but any relation that a lemon might have to, you know, the rest of the world, you know, every single yellow different yellow on that lemon might be in, you know, infinite or, you know, it, I haven't, I started to read that critique of Leibniz, but I haven't found the, the magic kind of notion yet um, in that book. Um, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, I think you're going to have a lot of fun talking to Marc Antoine, <laughs> I think. Um, I've got uh, yeah. some, uh, some, some of the I, I would be interested in, in kind of mapping MX a little bit into some massive stuff um, and seeing how that works. Um, uh, by the way, I'm also I'm also working with uh, Wendy Elford. Um, she and I are working on kind of UX for uh, for massive, and right now we're chunking we're chunking through. Uh, there's a, a core concept to wikis, and I also think to the sovereigns in the soup. Um, chunking, linking, chunk, chunking, naming, and linking. You kind of want to get the right clusters of things, um, and then you want to give it a name, a good name, and uh, and maybe you have to rename it once in a while. But and then you also link them together in interesting ways. Um, uh, so I'm interested in some of the like, like content stuff of, and maybe a little bit of the representation uh, of M of MX. But Mark Antoine has a lot of thinking about what he calls. Um, hyper-knowledge um, and he's got data structures that that would probably be like supersets of the data structure that you've got and then you might be able to pull out some of the concepts that he's he's been thinking of. Uh, Vincent did you want to say more? 
Um, not on that specific topic, but on some other things potentially. Um, let Just me let me show one map thing. Mark Antoine. Uh, it's uh, M A R C dash A N T O I N E space. Uh, uh, it, it's going to sound like uh, parent, or it's going to look like parent, but it's actually parent because he's Quebecois. Uh, so P A R E N T. Thank you. Um, let me share this real quick before we get too far away from maps. Uh, so Marc Antoine uh, hangs out in the Free Jury's Brain um, space. Uh, fantasy style maps, um, medieval, middle evilly looking kind of maps is another. So even though I know that there's a literalism that uh, isn't present in, in most people's conception of maps and mapping um, as we're thinking of it in information space, um, I think using a, a fantasy map is actually a, a clever hack um, on making it visual and affective uh, for people. So I'm, I'm also going to explore with that a little bit. Vincent, maybe you should talk for a while instead of me. <laughs> sure. So, um, well, on the point of the triples and duples, um, in in prototyping Trove, I've been playing around a lot with the different kind of like data data structures. Um, so, for example, at one point, I was thinking about skills, where like you have a, a person that can have multiple skills attached to their profile, but I realized you want to have another dimension there, which is you might want people to be able to vouch for skills. So then you have a user skill data type, which is connected to a user and then a skill, and then all the people that voted that vouch for that, that specific combination. And then you can have a, uh, you know, a list of your skills that are ranked by who voted for which ones. But then it kind of goes a step further where it's like, okay, well, what if you don't want to just have a yes or no? What if you want to have um, the ability to say Vincent has uh, this skill and it's a five out of a 10 um, and it's also at this time <laughs> and it might change over time. And so there's all these different dimensions you can add on to make things more complex to, um, to really kind of encapture someone's relationship to a skill. Um, and then you have like some whole, yeah, then you have three or four different data types just to encompass the relationship between the user and skills. And so I think um, with the triples and tuples, I don't have any like one rule that rules them all, but I would say it's very context specific in like what your app is trying to do. But at the same time, in this kind of uh, lens of interoperability, if you end up having skills and then somebody else is working on, Mark, if you're working on some you know, job platform um, where you wanna match people with the jobs and I only have the first layer of complexity of skills, then it might not be very useful for you and it might be incompatible. And so I think, I think understanding which tools that are working together have decided to make a decision because it's just simple but it might actually negatively impact the ecosystem as a whole. That's just an interesting thing that I've been thinking about is like, you can have careless data design that doesn't affect you, but it affects the commons inherently. So I have a heuristic where I've learned to, for my own project, certainly not for the internet archive or, or clients, um, for the most part, try to ask if I can take the data structure and make it into, you know, a duple. Basically, I have the notion skill. Um, coding Java skill coding JavaScript skill coding you know, uh, C++ and Vincent Arena. And I basically can link skill to Vincent Arena, um, skill C++ to Vincent Arena, skill C++ to Peter Kaminsky, Peter Kaminsky to Vincent Arena. And, and basically, you know, since they all are transitive, anytime Peter Kaminsky arises, there's a link to Vincent Arena 
and then to skill C++ skill Java and then or skill rating C++ you know master skill rating C++ novice um, and so I basically use the 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 I'm sorry uh, come on brain not classification oh category I use the category as um, the beginning of a alphabetically sorted you know string of classifications group of classifications so i basically see in my a sort of list skill colon c plus plus skill colon c plus plus colon novice skill skill colon c plus plus colon expert that would actually be alphabetically above novice but basically those are semantic tags to a simple you know integer primary key and the links just happen key to key automatically so you know it's easy to create a cloud but the categorization which used to be in a named column is in this alphabetically separated um categorization string with the heuristic from most general to most specific and you know it's weird um but i've been doing it for you know 30 years and um uh, i just you know um as we're as we're techie and can understand that kind of thing i thought i would contribute that not demand it or even suggest it but kind of say yeah there's a different way um, but it's really weird and we don't have all the tooling for it yet. And thank you for listening. Yeah. It's, I would, I would think that the ability to, <clears throat> to going circling back to how that, uh, jibes with what you were saying, Vincent, and, and also, you know, reputation stuff that I've been thinking about, um, that the flow, which can change of of expertise from one node to another um you know that that the the novice can become the expert and the outflow of um of valued input to the commons from you know that that change is a graphable thing um and and really cool to to be able to see um, yeah, I don't know. Really good stuff there. Yeah. And, and my, I think my point, um, and, and the, the aspect about changing over time was actually something while I was talking, I realized is important, but I hadn't actually, that's not something that I've actually built into <laughs> even the, the data structure I have now, but that's like another example of like, uh, I think there's just this inherent trade-off between like complexity of and redundancy in in like having your data structured in a certain way and making it interoperable so like mark i'm not sure and i'm talking about like a sql database so it's also dependent on the type of database structure you have um or like technology but so like if you have um a data type that's um user skill and user skill has uh, a, a skill, a user, and then a number versus you have uh, basically each skill, C++ has three different skills. There's C++ beginner, C++ you know, um, intermediary and expert. And then you just have users attached to those three like kind of like it's kind of a you know a duplicate of the uh of the skill with another added thing on top of it those are two d totally different structures that would give you different outputs and like i found myself in a situation where i'm like well this might be useful to have both and so <laughs> i'm actually when somebody adds a skill it's adding the skill to their profile but then it's also creating a user skill so that later if i want to be able to change it over time you can you can do that and so it's all like i don't know if that's a, the right way to go about it but i've been thinking about like just kind of capture 
it in different ways to see what will work. I, like, I guess I've, I've seen how when I have a specific structure, it like kind of constrains you from doing other things later. I have a hammer. And so I tend to try to use it for everything. And that hammer is two tables, one table of um, bit strings, um, any arbitrary bit string. It could be a video file. It could be a um, chunk of text, but that's not implemented yet. All I do is text right now. And then the second uh, link table where primary key is linked to the primary key you know, the parent to the child and a second record child to the parent. And, you know, it's all SQL. Um, but that's, you know, a limiting hammer, I, I, I realize, but it's the hammer that I'm kind of centered at. So I try to um, uh, stay there and kind of impl uh, in uh what is it uh, investigate all the implications which i think are are way beyond me um what i sent peter is the ability to have you know um not only that peter kaminsky is 1501 but if vincent recognizes that as a meaningful object then we have a table 1501 you know, um, to Vincent's number, um, uh, you know, 75. And then in addition, a different layer would be the number of times of 1501 to 75 to Vincent today, tomorrow, yesterday, three years ago, et cetera. And it's basically just creates this um, layer, these multiple layers of empirical thought events not when you thought it but when you typed it into the system so the system received the link peter to vincent you know by vincent you know 500 times but only by mark twice <laughs> so so it's this sort of non-algorithmic um pattern creation of just additive idea with the key but using that key to link idea to person and then idea to person to time, eh, optionally idea to person to time to location. And so it shifts the meaning onto the text and it removes the complexity from the relationships to just, is there a relationship or not? And we're, again, it's weird, but I'm, that's my hammer and that's my cross and that's my, um, you know, hopefully contribution to, you know, looking at what is the minimal notion of sense making, putting one idea next to another. And of mm -hmm. course, you know, the cognitive science notion would be cognitive blending or, you know, basically when you put Vincent next to Peter or dog next to cat, or lemon next to yellow, your brain automatically does things spontaneously, non-consciously, sometimes entering our consciousness, sometimes not. So it's really more um, of an exploration of the limit of consciousness than what's possible with the infinite, you know, connections of language. Um, but that's deep stuff that uh, is really hard to articulate and and uh, I get frustrated at my own inability to help people understand, you know, again, 37 years of not um, being, you know, in some kind of conversation about these ideas. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, our uh, UX, uh, UX uh, interface meeting for the Internet Archive is starting in seven minutes. So um, let me uh, simply um, post in the Flotilla Friday hackmind.io the list I've generated from this conversation. Thank you for listening. Wish I could listen more. Um, uh, it's on my backlog to create my Trove profile. Michael, good to see you. Peter and Vincent as well. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much, Mark. Mm -hmm.
we're we're jealous yeah, thanks, Mark. Of where you're going that sounds really cool internet yeah. archive ux sounds hot <laughs> it's it's our it's our kind of like free form meeting um the uh what is it we have a uh two week sprint so the sprint meeting was last friday and the you know play ideas is today so it's it's a bunch of programmers talking about you know uh what is it uh um uh, forgive my brain um the javascript um a uh, component um new stuff lit um so uh um, and, and, you know, what we're going to do to just, you know, display books better. And I do not find it exciting. <laughs> but, well, as, as an end user, I, I found it exciting. You know, our software sucks big, great big green donkey dicks. It's really <laughs> terrible. And, Everybody's does. And yeah, it is, it is so difficult to, to, uh, you know, think about people who are autistic and have different kind of ways of interacting with information, how to support them and, uh, um, you know, uh, left, what is that song? Left-handed, lesbian, albino, Eskimo. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's just so many um, different ways of, of, of people's um, encountering information and the uh as an epistemologist our motto what is it um universal access to all knowledge just it's just you know, let's have a constraint you know, let's, yeah, yeah. Let's, <laughs> this is great vision but anyway um i will uh post the uh uh my fatilla friday notes um before uh joining the meeting thanks again wish i could stay longer thank you mark let me mention real quick uh Kademlia, uh which is the uh it's a, a cool it's in the notes the hack md um oh okay that's uh, right you got the dead milkman um Kademlia. um it's so interesting to look at it and, and maybe it's useful algorithmically maybe it's just useful metaphorically there, there's an interesting mathematical hack they do there there's notions of semantic distance that i would love to you know and had many peer-to-peer -peer conversations this one is actually algorithmic distance and it's still interesting so sweet um god do i love um chayton and kolomogorov and you know all <laughs> these uh you know, semantic, you know, the complexity, algorithmic complexity, but also um, uh, Terry Deacon, who I study with, has this notion of dynamic depth, um, which is, you know, either you're at a homeogeneous kind of entropy level or you're um, uh, at a uh, self organization kind of uh, dissipation structure level, or you're at this coupling of self-organizing systems that prevent them from dissipating which is the origin of life and self and it's incredibly cool um that third layer which he calls teleodynamics the dynamic that creates a telos to at at at, at you know at minimum having this perdurance which means persistence so um boy um you know Life is fun with these uh, with these ideas everywhere. It's great to uh, you know know a bunch of new people who uh, are able to uh, you know join in wacky thinking. Uh, likewise, Mark. Thank you. Take care. Have a good one. You too. Bye bye. So in, unless um, there was anything on the past, that I, I have one other. Um, Kind of exciting idea i'd like to share um can i just follow on to the, and this may be related just to the the reputational structure stuff a little a little more down to earth um yeah. uh thought yeah sure um so one of the things that we've grappled with um from the beginning is the idea of um self self-proclaimed expertise and ratification of self proclaimed expertise as you're as you're doing Vincent with with Trove, um, which is cool. And and you're further along in some ways than we are. I mean, we just have the self um, 
acclaimed expertise, um, we're, <clears throat> what we've always wanted to do was um, link your self-proclaimed expertise to the dynamic of interaction with your with content that you have created, highlighted, uh, commented on, you know, using using our filter criteria to say, okay, this is this is Vincent's um, interaction. He he says he's an expert in you know uh, manned flight, and here's his interaction around content related to manned flight and the interaction of other people who proclaim themselves experts in manned flight. And we can see patterns that, um, that you know, of these five people who proclaim themselves expert, experts in manned flight, um, four of them are like following Vincent and, and you know, giving him just through interaction, not actual manual ratification, giving his expertise uh, a plug. And there's this other person out here who says they're an expert who, nah, nothing's happening there. They're just, they're just making stuff up. And then exposing that degree you know, that, that where you fit on the scale of whatever scale it is, a one to 10, a one to 100 of, of how your expertise looks um, in terms of your interactions to you so that you might say, hmm, I better not call myself an expert in, in man flight because clearly I'm not in comparison to the other experts in man flight. But it can tell you hey, you might not have thought that you were an expert in X, but your interactions on the platform show that, that the stuff you're posting is really valued by the people in this community. And therefore you really should say on your profile, I'm an expert in X, unless you don't want anybody to know, in which case that's your call. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, but that, that, um, that relationship particularly, I mean, like we're working with, like we have a hundred million items on the platform and 98 million i don't want to i don't want to be you know exaggerating no hyperbole here um, <laughs> but you know and most of those are not interacted with but you know some of them are extremely interacted with and some of them are original and you know how how we value all those things is i think something to work on we'll have to you know mm. figure out how to make that interoperable yeah, so so that's a really interesting point you bring up of like, yeah, starting to starting to use indirect measures, I guess, in a way to like to, mm -hmm. to try to correlate and and you know have reputation. I guess the the thing I mean, it's all gameable, but you know. <laughs> right. The yeah. the thing that is um, the variable that comes to mind for me as being important to talk about is Somebody like, hmm, who's a good example? Um, somebody who's like an expert in the field, but doesn't actually spend much time on the platform. Maybe they have an right. account, but they yeah. actually don't spend any time on it because they're so busy actually doing things, right? So I feel like it almost has to start at a level where it's like, everyone start, it's almost like you start at neutral and you could go negative or positive but mm -hmm. you kind of have to just trust that people are an expert if they say there are. And then sure. if the, the, the interactions on the platform can only send you positive or negative, they can't actually, right? But it could, because if you don't <laughs> interact on the platform, then what do you, like, how do you, right? And the other thing is if somebody uses Facebook but not Reddit and then somebody else uses Reddit and not Facebook, um, one person has have a way reputation and one person doesn't. Right. So you need to, so the, the part about interoperability is interesting because if you can create a more of a standard for that reputation, or if the reputation can be additive across multiple different platforms, then that's, that's interesting to me. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then the problem of how you bring like, okay, you develop this, this homegrown network of people who are, 
experts in X field and having a really good conversation, you know, and it's, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of some, something where there's a, just a well-known expert in that, you know, who suddenly comes onto the platform because they hear there's cool activity here and they are the, you know, the idolized person of all these other people, but their reputation doesn't reflect it because they're just lurking at the moment. And, yeah. and that's, where, that's where the ability for the on-platform experts to, as you're doing, manually ratify the expertise of this new person who's coming in to sort of say, hey, you know, we got the OG here and, and you know, we're, we're vouching for him. Um, right. Even though in part, the activity in here. Part and part of what would make that easier is if people have a pro, um, if people could have a ghost profile. But I feel I feel a bit torn about ghost profiles because I think they're kind of sketchy. Um, in expect if they're not <laughs> done in the right way. But like the fact that if you don't have a Facebook profile, Facebook still has a profile about you. Right, right, sure. um, how do you, how do you, but is there any way to do that in a way where it's like, oh, like I added this person as a, an indiv uh, as a person of notice on the platform because I want to add their YouTube video and link it to them so I can like find all their stuff later. For example, right. like I know people that have like made playlists about Daniel Schlockenberger's work and put it all together. And so if that was on a platform, like and Daniel wasn't on it, would they make a profile for him and then him have to claim it or or reject it? Like so, there's some there's some privacy concerns there. But I feel like that's from a technological standpoint, that seems like the obvious answer. But it's not simple to do it in a way that doesn't piss people off, in my opinion. Well, there's a, there's an interesting thing there that intersects with with um, some profile schema stuff that we've been talking about in the collaborative. Tech Alliance, um, where we're trying to differentiate between the profile that you manifest on given platforms and your identity that you are sovereign over and that creating a model where all data that any platform has about you in the ideal is, is reflected in your identity that lives on your devices and you have control of the release of, and you can re, renege on permissions to say, well, I don't, you know, this, this is utopian, but you know, the idea being that your identity is something you control. And if you, and if Facebook by virtue of wanting you to be a member there is obligated to show you what data they have on you, which they are, you know, thanks to, um, uh, you know, the, the standards that, that, that Europe has, um, has forced on people. I mean, technically you should be able to see all that stuff. Then you can say, oh, this field, nope, this field, nope, this field, okay, and, and start to govern your own data. And when you go to a new platform that has profile fields, you can say, okay, I'm happy to populate all those fields from my mother identity that I own. Um, and the idea of a ghost identity would be covered in a way in that because you'd, you'd say, here's here's the information that this platform has on me that isn't, isn't my real profile that's showing up on that platform, but it is okay with me for them to have that for purpose, for reputational purposes. I don't know, it, it's murky, but I, but I do think there's a, there's a paradigm there that can work. Hmm. Yeah, I guess um, that that whatever is doing the, I think everyone wants to be the the platform you're talking about that has the one identity that everyone pulls from. 
Well, then um, it, the point is that it can't be any one platform. It's, it's right. Yeah, yeah, no, no. It, that's not the the notion. Is yeah, that so it needs to be it the, needs to be agent centric. But I guess, yeah. Um, I I wonder if anything like that will. I feel like the network effects um, make it very hard to to create something like that because it's either like you make something opt in by default, or you make it where you can have the option to opt out. Um, and one is very clearly easier to grow something like that. And so that like a platform like that wouldn't be useful unless there was a lot of people using it. So you need to have like a, some collaboration that that people agree to use that as a standard. Um, I'm wondering how far well, along the, the te creative, the technical alliance is on, on that. Well, the way that we're thinking of it is, and, and I, I'm not, a builder of it, I've just been, you know, consultative, um, is that what we're creating is the field schema um, where, and, you know, with an eye toward it growing, where platforms who are participating are agreeing that they're making it possible for individuals to have this, you know, agent centric identity and that we'll feed into it. Um, so it's sort of like a nutrition label. It's, it's sort of like something where you're creating a standard that however small the group of people who are honoring it, the more, the more platforms honor the ability for people to have that transparency on the content on, that, on their platforms. It's not that anybody owns it. Um, but it is something that could expand, you know, platform by platform. It's, it's just, and it, and it doesn't really involve much technology on the platforms part. It's just like, I am willing to let you see what information we have on you. And by the way, that's going to create a new field that you didn't already have in your in your agent centric identity. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that, that answers your question. Obviously, you know, some will resist this and some will embrace it, but those who embrace it can grow incrementally. Uh, Michael, is Hilo the best place to hook up with the Collaborative Tech Alliance? Uh, you're muted. Sorry, they're on Hilo. They're on True.net. Um, I, I one thing I actually try to do is like because um, Hilo is just one platform within it. I kind of feel like you know there's there's a tendency to think because um, Tibet, who is with Hilo, is prominent in CTA, there's a little too much of an association there, which, you know, we don't intend, he doesn't intend. Um, so, but, you know, there is a, there is a high-low group for it. Um, there's also a true.net um, group for it. And the other thing I would say is um, every other Wednesday, and actually I, I meant to, um, Vincent, I had mentioned this to you and I'm sorry, I hadn't, hadn't sent a link yet, but there's a, there's an every other Wednesday, um, meeting, which is just a useful thing that generates documents. And um, there's a there's a template of a of, uh, nice cool spreadsheet of all the platforms who are involved and what their state is and differences are. And um, I'll, I'll share that link in Mattermost. Mm -hmm. um, thanks. For what it's worth, the high load join link is just spinning for me. There's a, a spinner on the page that's just spinning. Yeah, I actually tried this week uh, the article about the CTA from 2015. It was like, join us. And then I clicked the link. And <laughs> I don't know if that's the same link you're looking for. Yeah, but so, I yeah. So CTA existed. Figure out how to... CTA existed back then, went dormant. And it's really just been revived in the last year, I think. I mean, I've only been involved for a few months. Um, and, you know, I mean, 
there are so many organizations that I'm not holding it up as any kind of um, magic bullet, but it, it does seem to be, you know, the, the people who are involved seem like good folks all out for this, this same mission and trying to figure out how we do it. Vincent, there was something you were going to talk about. Yeah. So sorry about that, Vincent. You go. No, that was a great, uh, a great conversation. It's actually a perfect lean into what I wanted to share, but give me like 30 seconds. I just have to open up a doc. So um, something that I started this morning, which turned out to be super fruitful and um, a really great exercise that I would definitely suggest um, to you guys is I, I wrote a future press release. Um, have you guys ever heard of that? It might, it might sound self-explanatory, but the concept being you pick a date in the future and you write a press release about <laughs> yourself or your own product or about anything, honestly, um, as if it were just getting, you know, released and written, you know, two, three, five, ten years in the future. So I wrote a press release for Trove and its state of affairs in two years, May 28th, 2023. Um, I could read parts of it if you guys want, but it's it was such a cool exercise, to like put yourself in the future and actually think about like, what are the important things that you'd want other people to, to talk about? What are the things that are actually relevant and to kind of like work backwards is a, is a I think a useful thought exercise. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, it'd be fun to hear some. Yeah, sure. Okay, so you may have only heard about it recently, but Trove actually celebrates its two year anniversary this week. The community management app, which has seen a sudden rise in popularity as online communities started to rapidly form in response to the catastrophic 2023 fires, seems to be what individuals, communities, and networks of networks have needed to get serious about collectively fighting complex problems like climate change. Many users describe Trove as a combination between a social connection platform like Reddit and a collaborative knowledge management tool like Wikipedia. On the surface, this is an app description, but for the real power users, it's much more. They found success in making it easy for groups to collaboratively catalog knowledge, opportunities, and resources in a way that it can be shared within communities, but also across communities and networks that are working towards similar goals. It seems the key to this success has been the focus on helping users collaboratively manage large sets of link linked data without having to be fluent in software engineering or even in spreadsheet tools like Airtable. Thanks to their fervent focus on interoperable data standards, Trove has grown along with an ecosystem of tools called the Generative Commons Guild. Indeed, the app is still gaining momentum and our insider data has reported that over 100,000 communities joined in the last six months alone. Yet the only metrics that Trove reports on their website is not the quantity of communities, but the quality of the connections. Trove boasts an average connection score of each community to be an eight out of 10, which is representative of communities that they say have a strong core, but are also very well connected in strong networks. Facebook, which has a dwindling user base in the last two years, is of course working on its own variation of the same uh, dimension, which looks set to become Trove's biggest challenger. Although the opportunity is there, it seems that current Trove users have not migrated back to Facebook's platform, which also now plugs in directly to Facebook's AI voice assisted glasses. Um, <laughs> I could go on, it's, that's about a third of it. 
but uh yeah it's been a really interesting exercise um that's awesome love, yeah love to, love to hear more <laughs> i mean or or read more you know i don't have to <laughs> hear you now Pete, are you in agreement or I could I could also just send it when I'm done. <laughs> I, I would read it. Yeah. Um, you mean I like I it. You're a good writer or, too. What's you mean that? I you mean I should read it or you will read it? Uh, I'd rather read it. I mean okay. it, it's fun hearing you, but <laughs> I can think Sounds better good. reading. Right. We personally. should feel for the correct uh, press release experience. You know, we should be we should be reading it and not hearing the CEO mm. reading. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I'll stop there then. Um, but yeah, I would definitely um, encourage it as an exercise. It's awesome. Um, and yeah, I, I don't have anything else too pressing, but um, Pete, I did see your message about not uh, being able to create your Trove mm -hmm. account. And I think it's because the password reset link is only valid for uh, possibly 24 hours. Um, and so, yeah, every time I, <laughs> every time I send it to you, it, it's, it's been a, a lag, I think, until you actually click it so that I might have to just resend it. Um, and, and the other, the other thing that's happening is if I try to reset my password, I can't, I, or I don't get the, the email. So there's some, maybe, maybe it's because I don't exist yet that I can't reset my, or it doesn't send an email to me. Or something. Yeah. You don't have a password yet because you haven't created it. So you can't reset it yet. Yep. Yep. On the so, uh, so if you resend me another invite, I'll try really hard to get it <laughs> in time. <laughs> okay, cool. On the positive side, it all went smoothly for me. It was, it was good. I'm, I'm on. <laughs> I've uh, you know, endorsed it, a couple it, of people. You know, said I was. You know, all the all the, all the good stuff. Working on my cool. Um <laughs> One thing I wanted to ask you guys about, sort of related to the um, the reputational stuff um, and the material that we already have on platform, um, is when I heard you mentioning, I mean, you mentioned it again today, and then you would mentioned it, Pete, in the, the last meeting, the um, curation as, uh, as a, a marketplace, essentially, that's something that we've been working on um, and would love to, you know, further. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's a, it's a really interesting area in that, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about the expertise of the curation. It sort of has to go hand in hand with reputation, though the marketplace can be a reputational factor. I mean, obviously there's stuff people can put out there that's just clickbait. Um, so you don't want to just rate it on popularity, but you do want to rate it like the, the example that we always use is like, I don't want to see the news item that 3 million people clicked on. I don't want to see that lifted high for me to see. I want to see the thing that three people who are super experts clicked on. And, you know, and that, that's how I want to find the content that I then want to pay something for because I'm, I'm showing its value. Yeah. Um, anyway, I just would love to, to be involved with that. Yeah, I will. We'll get a little bit further in in talking about what we're talking about, and then and then I, well, I think we'll start doing you know some invites. Definitely. Okay. Cool. Um, that reminds me. I I that's the way I find Twitter people. Actually, I I it's it's funny how these platforms have an amazing asset that they, they don't that they don't leverage, right? right. So. Um, so. A lot of times I'll find, you know, I'll find something interesting either because somebody retweeted it into my feed or I'm poking around on a keyword search or something like that. And then I go look at what they've liked 
and who they follow and stuff like that. And then there's a treasure trove of, you know, relevance for me that yeah. Twitter actually kind of hides. Um, yeah. Medium has gotten even worse. They, they continually hide all the, the connectivity I want, you know, and they're trying to figure out how to do the connectivity they want. And I'm like, guys, you know, you're fighting it, me really hard. <laughs> it's really crazy for Medium to do it. You can understand why an ad supported platform does it because yeah. they don't want you to get exactly where you want to go quickly and then leave. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Medium, Medium should facilitate that. You know, we want to facilitate that. Um, yeah. I, the, it's okay. They've got the inverse problem, I think. They're trying to pay authors, right? So they have to. <laughs> I don't I don't even want to think about what kind of relevance they're trying to do but they're it's right. you know they're they're instead of generating revenue from ads they're trying to push attention and and right. and pay people for it right so it's kind of the opposite problem yeah yeah sure. there was another oh the other thing that the, the other thing that blows me away um uh um uh it's patreon um I've thought pretty hard. I've I've done some you know sketches, product sketches for for some kind of better relevance thing for Patreon, because you know if you go on Patreon, you can't find anything. You know, it's like just a big mess of like undifferentiated mess of stuff that I don't care about, right? And then f f by hook and by crook, and probably on Twitter mostly, um, uh, I've got some. I've got I I uh, patronize some people that are like. Oh my God, I, I, I don't know why everybody isn't following this person because they're just doing amazing stuff, right? And it's not amazing for everybody, but it's amazing for a large swath of people, you know, and, mm -hmm. and nobody can find it, you know? So yeah. it's super, another super interesting platform that has an asset that they can't, um, they can't uh, leverage. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that model, I also feel like, you know, they're, Somewhere between there and GoFundMe is the happy place for, um, you know, what what amount, yeah. um, you know, yeah. creators should expect, you yeah. know, and it's not it's not Apple's model. It's that you know single digit um, yeah. kind of transaction um, over over a bunch of like really ecstatic fans, yeah. Well, any, I don't know if uh, anybody has anything else, but this is, you know, this has been a rich one. Yeah. And, and I'd really love to, love to talk, um, you know, as always more about like how, how I can help, how, you know, factors, even how factors corpus might be useful, you know, just, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to our working out like whatever the ways are for the regenerative commons to like work with all our entities and and uh yeah it's um, um it's exciting it feels like like it's accelerating even now you know it's been going fast for six months or something but now it's even even more going faster faster farther cooler yeah um I, I want to just read one other like two sentences from this that i wrote um it was as for trudy a new user that switched from facebook um said um i really resonate with the fact that most of the information on the site is put into a digital commons sort of like wikipedia or a public digital library they don't block things behind a pay paywall that people who can afford it want to contribute and sign up especially because they get paid for their contributions they also don't lock you into the platform. It's quite weird that I could just pick up my data and move to another platform in their ecosystem if I wanted to, but it also gives me confidence that I can commit to using it without worrying that I'll regret it later. Um, so yeah, this is kind of, yeah, writing about like, yeah, the vision for being able to have multiple platforms working together and um, people getting, the marketing almost being collaborative where like yeah you can join a platform and start paying for it without thinking about it because you know it's part of a, a suite of tools that you could migrate to if you want to yeah and, and that's that's the thing that also relates to that that kind of profile standard that we were talking about you know it's it's not 
it's not it it's just something where like a nutrition label a group and it can be a very small group of entities are saying yeah we'll we'll abide by these standards of transparency um and you can feel comfortable that you can you know go from platform to platform we're not saying exactly what the protocols need to be we're just saying that these are the standards of transparency that are common here and get it to grow however incrementally it grows but at a certain point you know users say oh yeah it's 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 not like a seal of approval it's just a something they become expectant of and are you know find ease in just the way that just the way that Trudy does in your press release. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Cool. Well, I think I have to run. I have a 1.30 meeting. Yeah. It's so, super fun, folks. So, yeah. I'll post this one faster, Michael. Thanks for bugging okay. me on the last one. <laughs> really, I appreciate it. Thanks. Cheers, all. All, all right, right. Take care.